nature, almost every element combines with something else to form compounds. And so compounds can be made by connecting atoms by two methods. One is called ionic bond, and two is called covalent bond. Ionic bonding will give you a compound sometimes called as salt, and covalent bonding will give you compounds known as a molecule. In this lecture, we will only focus on the first one, compounds made by ionic bonding. And actually, I would like to start our discussion about bonding with elements that actually don't like to bond as much. If you can remember, there was a class of element called the noble gases. They are in the group 8A, consisting of helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. It turns out that these elements exist in nature by themselves. They do not link up with any other atom. And the reason for this comes from their electron arrangement. Remember that the electron arrangement says in the first level you can have a maximum of two electrons, on the second level, eight electrons, on the third, fourth, and so on level, have eight electrons. So when we look at helium, it has two electrons, so it fills up completely the first shell. So this gives us our first noble gas. Moving on to the second shell, we have an element that has 10 electrons, two in the first shell, and an eight in the second shell. With eight electrons in the second shell, it is again a complete shell, and this element is neon. And again, the pattern is that neon is a noble gas. From neon, we move on to the third shell with an element that has 18 electrons. 18 electrons mean it has two in the first shell, eight in the second shell, and another eight on the third shell. Again, filling up that shell completely. That element is argon, and again, argon is the noble gas. And it turns out there is something special about having a full shell of electrons. When you have a full shell of electrons, you are especially stable. And if atoms are like humans, we can say they are happy when they are stable. Because of this stabilization, atoms of the noble gas elements do not need to make bonds with any other atoms, even to another noble gas atom. That is why we can find a single atom of helium or argon in nature, just all by itself. You can't say this about other elements like oxygen is always found with others. For example, there are two oxygen atoms in the molecular oxygen that we breathe. And because of this stabilization, we have what is known as the octet rule, which states that all other elements, once you achieve the same electron arrangement as the noble gases with eight valence electrons. A little side note to that is that there's also a duet rule, and this duet rule applies to hydrogen and helium, which are the first two elements because they only have one and two electrons respectively. So in simple terms, if you are an atom, your goal in life is to be like the noble gas. So how would you imitate the electronic arrangement of a noble gas? The electron arrangement for chlorine is 287. The electron arrangement for sodium is 281. So for both of these atoms, you do not have a full octet. For chlorine, you have seven. You are one electron shy of a full octet, actually. And then for sodium, you have one electron. You are very far away from a full octet. So what is an atom to do if it doesn't have an octet? Well, it turns out it can do of two things. It can either give or take electrons, or it can share it. In either of these methods, it creates something called a bond. So the first strategy will result in something that is called an ionic bond where atoms can lose or gain electrons. A prime example of this is sodium chloride. The other strategy to achieving a full octet results in something called a covalent bond. And this strategy involves sharing electrons. A prime example is when chlorine and chlorine combine together and sharing electrons to make chlorine gas. We will discuss in detail covalent bonds in the next lecture. And so for this lecture, we will focus on ionic bonding only. So let's go back to this example of chlorine and sodium. Again, chlorine you see here has seven electrons in its valence electron, so it just needs one more to make eight electrons. Whereas sodium has one electron in its valence electron. So you can imagine sodium thinking, hmm, to have a full octet, I can either gain seven electrons, take seven electrons from someone else, or I can just simply give one electron away. And it turns out giving one electron away is so much simpler than taking seven electrons from someone else. 
So you can imagine sodium and chlorine atom kind of striking a deal and saying, hey, if I give you my one electron, you can have eight electrons as your valence electron. And at the same time, now since I have zero electrons in my outermost shell, my outermost shell automatically becomes the second level instead, which is already eight electrons full. And so that's exactly what happens. The electron arrangement for both atoms are now full octets. Now since chlorine has received an electron, it now becomes more negative. And sodium giving away electrons becomes more positive. So we can't simply call them atoms anymore. Instead, we now call them ions. Chlorine ions and sodium ions. So to illustrate this point, let's take a look again at sodium and chlorine combining together in an ionic fashion. When sodium gives away its electron to chlorine, sodium becomes a positive ion. And when chlorine receives that electrons from sodium, chlorine becomes a negative ion. Now that we have a positive charge and a negative charge, what do we know about the attraction between a positive and a negative charge? Right? They are very strongly attracted to each other. This attraction is what we call an ionic bond. And this bonding occurs in a one-to-one -one ratio. For every one sodium, there is one chloride. The reason for this is charge balance. Most things in nature will be electrically neutral. So in order for the substance to be electrically neutral, the charge of the positive and the charge of the negative must be equal to each other to balance each other out. So mathematically, we can see that the sodium is positive 1 and the chloride ion is negative 1. So positive 1 plus negative 1 is equal to 0. We can write sodium subscript 1, chloride subscript 1. But remember that whenever there's just a 1 in a subscript or a superscript, we kind of ignore it. So we can simply write this as NaCl without the subscript, and everyone would understand that this ratio is 1 to 1. Now, I just want to remind you that just because there's a 1 to 1 ratio of Na plus and Cl minus in this compound doesn't mean there's 1 Na plus and 1 Cl minus only. They actually exist in a lattice of billions and billions of them. It's just that there is an equal amount of both of these ions, right? Um, so a sodium ion here in, in uh, pink is, uh, will be attracted to and sits next to many, many uh, chloride ions. And the chloride ions in green here, on the same manner, sits next to and is attracted to many, many sodium ions. Now, how many uh, it sits next to, that's another matter. You may learn that in the next um, level of chemistry class. In this class, we just know that they exist actually in a lattice. Now, the extent of this lattice, how large this lattice is, really depends on the size of your salt. For example, if you see an image here of a sodium chloride salt in a rock form, it's rather big, right? Which is different from the salt you get at a salt shaker, which is very small. But if you zoom in on both of those structures, you can see that they both exist in a lattice. The difference, though, is that there will be many more atoms in a piece of rock here, rather uh, compared to the granulated salt in a salt shaker, there would be less um, as sodium and chloride ions. Another thing I want to point out with this image is that the sodium chloride um, compound exists in this lattice and the shape is very cubic. And you can actually see that manifest in this rock, uh, in this salt rock, where it is very actually jagged and cubic also. So, so here is another key distinction between ionic and molecular compound. The ionic compound that we just talked about, where we say sodium chloride exists in a lattice, um, where there is billions and billions and billions in the one-to-one -one ratio, but they are all connected to each other, right? Whereas in a molecular compound, when we say, for example, water, H2O, we actually mean in that one molecule, there's only two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen they are one single entity separate from another, whereas in a ionic compound, they are all connected. You can break them, and you have now two pieces of salt, for example, but you can never just have one atom of sodium and one atom of chlorine. So it's good to kind of have this in a molecular perspective. Let's take a look at another example. So let's explain how magnesium and chlorine combine to form magnesium chloride MgCl2. Again, magnesium has two valence electrons, so it needs to give away those valence electrons. One way it can give away those valence electrons is that it can give one to each of a chlorine atom. 
resulting in a magnesium 2 plus ions and two chloride minus one ions. In this example, the ratio is one to two. For every one magnesium ion, there are two chloride ions. And the reason for this, again, is to have a neutral charge balance. Mathematically, again, we can see that if we have one magnesium ion, that's a two positive, and if you have two chloride ion, each of those chloride ions is negative one, so that's basically positive two plus negative two equals to zero. So to write this compound, we write Mg without a subscript because the subscript again is one and Cl with a subscript of two.